Hi, I'm Neil MacDonald. I run Megalithic Tours and I'm going to take you on a tour of all the megalithic sites of the entire Cumbrian Lake District, a beautiful part of the country that I've been visiting for many years now. And what better place to start than Castle Rig Stone Circle, up here in the Northern Lake District, not far from Keswick, and surrounded by a, a magnificent amphitheatres of mountains. Here we've got uh, Skiddle, we've got uh, Blencathra, long scale fell over here, and in the far east we've got Helvellyn. Castle Rig Stone Circle is one of the oldest monuments of its type, definitely in Britain and probably even in Europe. There are one or two interesting features in the centre of the circle. Uh, this is one of the burial, the bronzes burials, there's three of them. You just about see the outs outs outskirts of the circumference here. Another interesting feature is unique to Castle Rig. Uh, you, don't, you don't see it really anywhere else. It's called the Sanctuary and it's sort of a rectangular uh, alignment of, of stones here. What's it for? Absolutely no idea. So as Alexandra Tom who first spoke of Castle Rig Stone Circle as a Neolithic observatory, pointing out the, the various alignments that run through the circle uh, indicating and setting the, the solstices and the equinoxes. Another interesting feature is the outlying stone, 300 metres in that direction. This is the outlying stone here. Apparently it's been moved not far, just from about here, where apparently there was a long time ago, totally gone now, another stone circle here. There actually was another circle as well, apparently, over far over in that direction, towards the north really. This mountain here is called Blencathra, but it's also called Saddleback because of the unusual dip in its peak. But more about this later. So here we are east of Castle Rig, where two henges remain of what must have been a much larger ancient site. This is King Arthur's Round Table. You can see I'm stood here on the central area. And you can see the well-defined ditch here and the embankment. Over here is the remaining portal entrance. The other portal entrance was here, which has now disappeared under the road. But I think that entrance would lead, once upon a time, over to the other major henge, over there, Maybra Henge. So here we are at Maybrahenge, this is directly across the road from King Arthur's Round Table. And you can see the entrance to the, to the henge there, the portal entrance and the two banks. And if you look straight through the portal, you can see the one remaining standing stone still present there. Now there used to be four other stones, according to Stukeley, that were placed in the entrance in two, in two rows, suggesting a stone avenue once led from Maybra right across the road into King Arthur's Round Table. So let's now go into Maybra and have a look round. This is the entrance portal to Maybra Henge. See the two embankments here rising up to either side. The stones here you can see were brought, were brought from the nearby rivers. Would have been millions of stones collected up to build these embankments. It's a fantastic feat of engineering. Now this is the only henge we know that's actually got only one portal entrance. So where's the other one? Well it's said that the mountain of Blencathra, over in the distance that we just saw earlier, is actually the other, the other henge to the monument, uh, and the sandalback representing the, the portal entrance. Now this, this henge actually faces due east, which means that the rising equinox sun will rise through the portal entrance. 
So just imagine looking over Blencathra at the equinox and watching the sun set over the saddle. So here we are in the centre of the Henge. You can see there's just one remaining stone here now. Originally there was four recorded in a sort of a diamond shape, possibly marking off the cardinal points or possibly acting as some sort of sundial where the, the sun would set shadows across uh, to point out various times of the day. But look at this amazing Henge here. Uh, it originally would have been solid, obviously no trees then, uh, all the way around and covered in white gypsum. So we travelled further east still to Long Megan Daughters and here we've got a massive stone circle, one of the biggest in Britain and a huge outline over there called Long Meg. Now this must have been the centre of a much larger ancient landscape. A couple of sites are still here and we're visiting those shortly. Now Long Meg stands at the northeastern corner of the area that we've been covering. The three other large stone circles at the other corners, there's Castle Rig, which we've already visited, that's at the, the north uh, west. To the southwest, there's Swinside Stone Circle, and to the south east, there's Gamelands. Now, the story here is that the, <clears throat> it was Michael Scott, he was a, a wizard from uh, Scotland, and he, he turned a coven of witches to stone for dancing on the Sabbath. And the story is, if you come down here and you can count the stone circle, uh, the stones of the stone circle twice and get the same number, they'll turn back into a whole load of dancing witches. Fantastic. Well, I'll tell you from grim experience, although this sounds like a wonderful party to be invited to, it doesn't work. This is Long Meg herself. This is the outliner to the uh, Long Meg and her daughter's ancient site. She was said to be here a lot earlier than the, the stone circle and one interesting feature is the, the, the lines or the sides of, the, of her point out the cardinal points but by far the most interesting feature here are the ancient spirals up here and down here. This is Long Meg's smaller partner, Little Meg. Now it's said that this used to be a burial cairn, but either way it's a beautifully formed little stone circle. This is the largest stone here, about three and a half feet tall. But by far the star of the show is this one here. It's got some wonderful carvings of spirals and concentric circles. Probably the best spirals of any site in Britain. If you could take the field boundary away, you'd see Long Meg over in that direction. And interestingly, if you follow this, this hedgerow here, it would take you right through the middle of Long Meg Stone Circle. And then at a right angle from here, or 2,500 feet in that direction, is an ancient cross in Addingham 
church churchyard. There are many wonderful ancient and historical churches in the Lake District. And this is a fine example here. This is Addingham Church. It's uh, St Michael's and All Angels. It's a wonderful red brick. Beautiful. Uh, but what we've actually come to see here is this. It's the ancient thumb cross with its uh, elaborate spirals and the central hub here and the four circles. It must have marked this area as sacred and it's definitely part of the ancient landscape that takes in Long Meg, uh, Little Meg and probably Glastonbury stone circle over there to the north. There are a couple of really interesting things worth seeing inside the church before we leave. In the church porch here we have this Viking Hogsback stone. There's a few of those in Lake District. We'll look at some more of those in, uh, in Penrith soon. This is a Crusader Knights grave stone. You can see that we've got uh, the cross and the sword next to it. The other remaining site of the Long Meg Cluster is Glastonbury Stone Circle. Now it lies due north of the circle at Long Meg and an alignment straight through the cross in Addingham and here it stands on its levelled out platform. It's a little bit different than your average stone circle because you'll notice that the, the stones are very much knit, closely packed together. Stone circles usually have quite a distance between the stones. So it could have been a burial area, we're not quite sure really. And somewhere on here, there are some carvings as well, like there are at Long Meg and Little Meg. But they can't find them here, it's, they're almost pretty, pretty much lost. At the moment though, this is a, looks like an episode of Watership Down, the amount of rabbits here, it's like a, it's like a warren. The nearest large town to Long Meg is Penrith. And we're here in the churchyard of St Andrews to see this. This is the, the giant's grave, a fine collection of hogsback stones and flanked by these two magnificent 11 feet tall Viking crosses. Now the story here is that this was the grave of old King Caesarius, the penultimate king of all Cumbria. Now we don't know how much truth there is in this of course, but during the 17th century there was an excavation and they found the remains of a very tall man with his broadsword. Just a few yards from the giant's grave is this cross. It's from the Saxon Strot Viking period, about 920. Now it's supposed to have been erected by King Caesarius as a memorial to his father. Inside the church, this plaque tells a story of a devastating time in Cumbrian history. It was in the 16th century when the plague wiped out up to 40% of the surrounding population. This brass plaque is actually a replacement for an old sandstone plaque, which is above it. <clears throat> which you can see is very, very much worn out now. So during times of plague, they really need to keep any infection within the town limits itself and therefore away from the surrounding areas and the farms because these made the food. So for this reason, a system of plague stones was set up. 
This is one here on the, on the outskirts of Penrith. And the idea was that farmers could bring the, the produce and leave them here to be collected by the, the, by the townsfolk and their payment would be left in this, this hollow here which would be full of vinegar therefore it would, it would disinfect the money keeping the farmers free from the plague. We're heading south now from Penrith towards the Shap area where there's another set of ancient sites but it's worth stopping off on the way to look at this. It's a very unknown site or a little known site. It's a long cairn. This site is huge. It faces east and it stretches off 70 yards to the west. So we've travelled south now from Penrith down to the Shap area. Now the ancient sites here in this area, once upon a time, would have rivalled anywhere in Europe. There's not much left now unfortunately. We've still got the Kempal Stone Circle here, which unfortunately has the main line, the main railway line from Euston down to Glasgow running right through the middle of it. There used to be another little arc of the, the circle at the other side, but unfortunately uh, that's disappeared under some sidings going through a concrete works. Now from here there would have been a stone alignment heading off over a mile uh, south down what is now the A6 straight through Chapter out little village centre to a hillock in the distance which once had a chambered two on it. Now this hill was called Skull Hill Hill probably because of the skulls that were found in the chambered tomb. That's all gone unfortunately. There are two huge stones left of the avenue. There's a Goggleby stone and the Aspis stone. We'll, we'll, we'll go and have a look at those now. Many of the monuments in the area are made of the locally mined red granite which has pink feldspar crystals embodied in it. According to the researches of Professor Philip Callahan, the red granite was one of the most paramagnetic substances ever measured. And as such it was actually used in the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramids on the, on the Giza Plateau. So this fine 12 tonne stone here is what's left of the Stone Avenue. This and the Asprey stone in the next field down there. But the Goggleby stone here, I stood here for 5,000 years. Apart from once when it fell over in 1969. But I say falling over once in 5,000 years isn't that embarrassing. It was actually picked up by the, the uh, archaeological department of Lancaster University and concreted back in its socket. It's still used by local pagan groups. Sometimes you can see the, the remnants of rituals down the bottom here. Fine stone, the Goggleby stone. So this is the other stone that's still left in the now more or less defunct Shap Stone Avenue. You can see the Goggleby stone over in the next field there. This is the Aspis stone, so called because it's in Aspis field. But the interesting feature here is this cup and ring mark. Just a mile north of the, the Shap Avenue is the Shap Beck Cut Stone Circle here. Um, it's not in a good state of repair at all. It originally was a triple concentric ring circle, uh, which is a very rare site. Uh, but you see, it's quite a mess. It's very rarely visited as well because it's right in the middle of a crop field and in, in summer you, cannot, you can't even see it. Recently these posts have been added, it must be for some sort of protection, but it's seen better days. Luckily though, there are many, many more stone circles in this area. So let's go and visit a few. Let's have a whistle stop tour of a few of the stone circles just around this area.
This is the first one, it's Castleton Stone Circle. It's a lovely dinky little circle with uh, very small stones, but it's sat here on its own levelled out platform and it's been here since the early Bronze Age. But what a beautiful setting it's in, with all of Castle Castleton Fell in the background, right over the, the whole of the valley of the River Loon. So this is Gamelin's Stone Circle. It's sitting here under, under Knot Hill. It's made of the local red granite and it's one of the huge stone circles, the large one that's actually situated to the southeast of the area that we're covering. Most of the stones have actually been knocked down on here, here unfortunately, and that happened in the 1860s when the henge here that was present then actually got ploughed out. So all the ancient sites of Shap extend throughout the whole area and this is off to the east where, where the sites are marked by this huge piece of red Shap granite which is called the Thunderstone. And just off over there, just out of sight, is Castle House Stone Circle. Uh, we'll just go and visit that now. Castle Half Stone Circle is a gateway to an ancient area that has at least four stone circles and two settlements. So high up on Oddendale Fell, this is a wonderful stone circle, it's called Oddendale and it's a concentric stone circle, it's an outer ring and an inner ring. This is the inner ring here which is said to be from the Bronze Age but the outer circle which is 86 feet is earlier, it's from the Neolithic. This five and a half feet tall megalith here is called the Copstone and it used to mark a trackway that went off in that direction and eventually would meet up with the Sharp Avenue. But now it marks the entrance to the Moor Divock here which is an ancient landscape where we find various burial mounds but more importantly a lovely big stone circle called the Cockpit. In the days before I knew about our megalithic past, I used to spend many, many hours walking in the Cumbrian fells here. And I remember once coming across these stones, I sat and had my sandwiches and wondered why the farmers had set them out in a circle like this. Of course, I know now it's the cockpit stone circle. And what a beautiful place our ancestors chose to raise these stones. We've very nearly finished our quick tour around the stone circles of the Shap area and we're about to head off north to Penrith then across to Keswick and to the, the west coast but before we do there's one more stone circle 
and it's the Gunners Coldstone Settle and it's right on the edge of the M6 motorway. So now, as the saying goes, for something completely different. I mean, what are these strange creatures to be found in the churchyard in Dhaka? They've been known as bears since 1890, where the, Red, the Reverend Richard Ferguson wrote a story about the back Dhaka bears, but I don't think the bears. What do you think? The 1,250 tonne boulder stone has been standing here beneath Hell's Wall for over 10 millennia. It was probably an, er an early meeting place or a proto temple. In 1798, Mr. Pocklington actually bought the stone and built a temple underneath it. So we're on our way now to the west coast of Cumbria. There's a good sea view over in that direction. But at the moment, we're in the wilderness, high up here on Blakely Rise. The high ground here stretches up there to 1,150 feet above sea level. And this is Blakely Rise Stone Circle. There's actually 11 of the 12 original stones still in situ here. But at one point, eight of them were actually removed and used in local building projects for gateposts, that sort of thing. Until, in 1925, a certain Dr Quinn gathered all the stones up and brought them back here and rebuilt the circle. Thank you, Dr Quinn. Excellent job. This is beautiful here. The first recorded church here in the village of Gosforth dates back to the 12th century. But there would have been another structure here before this, dating back much earlier. It would have been a wattle and daub structure probably. But we're here to see the Viking artefacts. And this is the finest Viking artefact anywhere in Cumbria. The Gosforth cross here stands at 14 and a half feet tall. And it's a slender shaft here 
represents the, the Yggdrasil tree. That was the Norse tree of life where Odin once held, held from the branches to get the wisdom of the runes. And below it there's, there's four flat sides and these represent tales from the, the Volupso. The Volupso is part of the Poetic Edda, which is part of the Norse mythology. The four sides here represent firstly the creation, then there's the Battle of Ragnarok, the Armageddon War, then there's the end of the world, and finally the return of Baldr, and new life. used to be four crosses in the churchyard at Gosforth, now there's only the Gosforth cross left. But there's two other remains of uh, the crosses built into the wall in the church here. And there's also a section of one of the crosses which is called the fishing stone. Here it is. The story on the plaque tells of how Jarangande, the world serpent, was thrown into the sea by the god Odin. And it grew so large that it surrounded the entire planet and eventually caught his own tail. The god Thor then took a fishing trip with the giant Hymar, who stuck Jarangande with his famous hammer. Unfortunately, Hymar cut the fishing line holding the serpent, and the serpent sank beneath the waves, never to be seen again. These two hogsback stones were found beneath the church when an extension was being built. They've got to be the best preserved Viking hogback stones anywhere. They're called the Warriors Tomb and the Saints Tomb and they're magnificent. Just west of Gosforth, sitting on the, the shores of the Irish Sea, is this, this is the Greycroft Stone Circle. It's a magnificent stone circle with huge stones, it's a big circle as well. Unfortunately it's very rarely visited, basically because of its proximity to, to the Sellafield Nuclear Power Station, which is a shame because it's a beautiful site. Our ancient ancestors used to gather at the meeting of ancient trackways. And the Ayrton Cross here stands at the meeting of four, which is why this fantastic cross would have been built in the first place, and why eventually the church would have been built next to it. 
This is one of the, the most important uh, 9th century crosses anywhere in Britain. It stands here at 10 feet tall and it's covered with these wonderful Celtic designs. And luckily the cross has still got its head because the Puritans in Cromwell's time used to uh, chop off the top of the, these uh, fine crosses. So here we are in the southwest of uh, Cumbria, up, in the, up on the fells again, and we're visiting my favourite stone circle. This is Swinside. It could very much be said to be a compadre of Castle Rig, as it's the large stone circle that covers the whole area that we're covering on, the, on this, this film, and it's the, the stone circle to the southwest. But there are one or two interesting features here at Swinside. This is the portal entrance here with these two sets of uh, megaliths which would have probably once upon a time been the beginning of an ancient processional other which went off into the southeast. Because this portal entrance faces southeast and therefore the winter solstice sunrise would have shone down the processional way and into the circle. One remarkable feature here at Swinside involves this stone here. It's the north face north marker stone and the notch on the top of the stone here when aligned up with the mountain next to it the notch on the top there points out due north The Giant's Grave Standing Stones are the only site of its type in the Lake District, although they are very similar to the Penros Filou on Anglesey. They've been standing here on this plateau for 5,000 years, just off the Dudden Sands on the southern coast of the Lake District, being overlooked by the mother goddess Hill Black Coombe. Now, if you follow this alignment straight through to the northwest, you end up right through Swinside Stone Circle again. Now it's highly possible that these two stones marked a T-junction of ancient trackways. This, this way following the coastline and this way through the stones straight through the valley.
So we've travelled now from the High North Lake Districts, uh, Keswick and Penrith, and here we are on Brettrick Common on the south coast of Cumbria, overlooking uh, Morecambe Bay here. And we've come to see the Druid Circle, and this is it. It's a concentric circle again. Uh, there's still a few stones left of the outer circle, but the inner circle uh, is still very much intact with 27 stones of the local limestone. The most interesting feature about this site though is that during excavation they found a flooring. The actual stone circle was terraced. This is something that is just unheard of. So we've reached the end of our megalithic journey of the Lake District. I oh, really hope you've enjoyed the ancient sites that we've visited. But if it's whetted your appetite, please do join us on a megalithic tour.